Hey, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our educational webinar on common foot problems and how to take care of your feet. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Ralph Napolitano, podiatrist and wound care specialist at OrthoNeuro. Dr. Napolitano is a double board certified podiatrist and wound care specialist physician specializing in medicine, surgery, and wound care of the foot, ankle, and lower leg. He is the director of wound care and healing at OrthoNeuro. Dr. Napolitano will answer questions following his presentation. Please type your questions into the Q&A below at the bottom of your screen. Take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Hannah. I uh, appreciate that introduction and thank all of you for attending tonight. Uh, so all of us here in Central Ohio, I, I think it's safe to say we are uh, smack dab in the middle of winter, but spring is around the corner. And we're gonna talk about these common foot problems and getting your feet ready for uh, the warm weather. So I think we're all ready for that. The question is, will your feet be ready? So podiatry, uh, that's my specialty. Again, I'm part of the foot and ankle uh, division here at OrthoNeuro. Uh, this uh, division of medicine is devoted to the study of diagnosis and medical and surgical treatment of disorders of the foot, ankle, and lower leg. So we take care of a body region, not just an organ system of bones and joints. So this uh, lower extremity is what we're stewards of and taking care of all these things that can go wrong uh, with that lower extremity. Now, interesting, here in Ohio, uh, we've retained a small part of a heritage a profession called chiropody. And what this means is we can treat uh, skin and nail disorders of the hand. And in my practice, I, I treat fingernail fungus, sometimes an ingrown nail on the hand as well. Podiatry is not new. It's been around for a very long time, since ancient times. In fact, in ancient Egypt, uh, carvings depicted at that time showed foot care. Uh, Hippocrates, the uh, great scientist and uh, early physician, described care of corns and calluses and skin problems. Napoleon, President Lincoln, also had podiatrists as well. Uh, the first society of podiatry was established in New York in 1895. Other countries followed. So the fabulous foot, a few facts here. So uh, the uh, foot is comprised of very complex anatomical constructs, and about a quarter of our bones or in the foot, we're talking 26 bones, 33 joints, 100 tendons, muscles, and ligaments. Um, not necessarily an appetizing fact here, but feet produce half a pint of perspiration daily from their 250,000 sweat glands. The average person will take enough steps to walk the earth four times, which is pretty amazing. Uh, women experience uh, foot problems four times more often than men, possibly related to shoe gear, okay? So uh, this is a huge topic, certainly. Lots of things that can go wrong uh, with your feet. And our focus is some of the more common things. And as we uh, break out of the winter doldrums and uh, take that spring break, uh, getting ready. So um, we're going to discuss what these problems are. Again, the, the top most common uh, problems I treat, how to treat the problem and prevention. Now, traumatology is a whole different uh, subject. That's something we're not going to go uh, in too much detail about. So we'll credit this gentleman. Uh, Mr. Dave Letterman had his famous uh, top 10 list. We're gonna do top six tonight. So we're gonna start with our number one problem. Uh, and these aren't in necessarily a particular, uh, particular order, but of these uh, six problems, these are definitely the most common categories that we see um, in my field. So skin problems of the foot. We'll, we'll start off with uh, nail fungus, toenail fungus, okay? Half of us will be diagnosed with nail fungus by the time we're 70, all right? It's caused by uh, types of microscopic fungal organisms. Think about a microscopic plant, if you will, okay? Signs and symptoms include nail thickening, a deformity of the toenail, discoloration, sometimes a foul odor, and with that deformity, it can actually pinch into the skin. Of special concern is this problem if you have some immunocompromise. So diabetes is certainly a very common condition we're all familiar with, um, but that's a form of immunocompromise. Circulatory problems, if you're a cancer patient and you're immunosuppressed, these are certainly uh, relevant uh, conditions related to uh, toenail fungus. Left untreated, 
what we see is the toenail can actually become damaged permanently. So it's of utmost importance to treat this early on. And this is what this looks like. We've probably seen uh, this on, on friends or relatives, a milder presentation. The toenail is just slightly yellowed, slightly thick. And then as we get uh, more progressive in the disease course, we get this severe deformity. And again, left untreated, uh, it's hypothesized that the toenail root can get damaged uh, beyond repair, even though we uh, clear the, the fungal infection itself, okay? Uh, I mentioned uh, in my field, treating uh, skin and nail disorders of the hand on occasion. Uh, the picture in the center of the screen shows a, a patient with uh, fingernail fungus. So we see this sometimes in people that uh, work in industry and related uh, uh, professions that uh, their hands are in wet, uh, damp environments. And of course, you see more examples of toenail fungus at the bottom of the screen there. So how do we treat this? Well, it is an infection. So just like we would treat a bacterial infection, antibiotics, if you will, antifungals treat fungal infections, okay? Uh, topicals are another uh, modality. Uh, next generations are now available, and there's some very good ones that are just about as effective as oral. In fact, there's some out there that are on par as oral medications. I'd like to point out that uh, in, in some patients, certain medications that they need to be on can affect uh, the liver and some other organ systems. Antifungals orally have that propensity. So we have to be cognizant about taking oral antifungals depending on your underlying conditions or other, medica other medications that you have. Uh, topicals, there's essentially no side effects although sometimes you can get a little bit of irritation. That's a small reaction that we see. Now, in our practice uh, at OrthoNeuro, we use laser to treat toenail fungus. Lasers are used a lot in medicine by heat and light energy uh, and how we manipulate uh, those parameters can do lots of things from uh, taking care of toenail fungus to reducing scars, to removing hair, to taking care of uh, vascular uh, lesions or varicose veins. And what we have found is combination therapy. So different things in conjunction uh, with each other certainly help uh, clear this. So doing laser together with possibly oral medication or topicals with laser have shown to have this synergistic, uh, very good uh, effect. And I can't stress enough, treating this early on is very important. Studies have shown that the earlier you get to this, the better your outcome will be to avoid that long-term problem and possible nail deformity that we've referenced. Prevention, uh, going barefoot in public places, such as a gym shower floor, having your flip-flops there is just a, a good measure. Uh, basic foot hygiene and nail care, and what I say, pedicure awareness. Uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with getting pedicures, but uh, certainly if you go to an establishment for the first time and it doesn't feel right, um, it probably isn't. Uh, of course, these folks, this is their livelihood that own these establishments. So they have to adhere to the cosmetology board, which is a dotted line to the health board. Uh, so uh, certainly, you know, just being aware, okay? Um, another thing I talk about in my practice, not only foot health, but shoe and sock health. Where do our feet live? So they live in shoes. This is one of the, uh, one item of clothing or an, an item of clothing, if you will, that isn't taken care of regularly. So things to uh, take care of your shoes, to keep them uh, fresh and sanitized, everything from simple sprays to ultraviolet shoe sanitizers. Socks, laundering them, certainly common sense type things, but uh, additives to your laundry, um, certain disinfectants, et cetera, all that can be very helpful. Moving on, we talked about uh, toenail fungus. Now we're talking about uh, fungal infections of the skin, athlete's foot. Okay, so like toenail fungus, this is caused by common microscopic organisms throughout the environment. Signs and symptoms of this, those of us that have had this are very familiar. Uh, scaling and cracking of their toes, of the soles of the feet, blistering. Okay, advanced cases can result in a bacterial infection as well. Now, ba bacteria and fungi are kind of mortal enemies and they don't really play well together, but if when unchecked, they can uh, synergistically uh, feed off of each other in that environment. So toenail fungus, uh, if you will, going back to toenail fungus can spread to the skin and vice versa, okay? Again, if you have an immunocompromised or underlying conditions, if you're diabetic or have immune problems, 
this can be of special concern as well. And this is what this looks like. You can have a blistering type presentation that's called vesicular athlete's foot or tinea pettis, the more crusting kind, the dry kind, intertriginous between toes, certainly. Um, this is all presentations that we see with athlete's foot. So again, being a, a fungal infection, oral medications, all right, but a shorter course are used compared to toenail fungus or fingernail fungus, creams and ointments uh, in combination with steroids sometimes. I will say that <clears throat> going back to toenail fungus, topicals traditionally haven't been the most beneficial because having that medicine penetrate through that nail plate has been difficult. And where we've made a lot of advances over the past few years is the medication having vehicles uh, to be able to penetrate. So the medication formulas are able to penetrate to get into that toenail fungus. It's not as difficult with respect to uh, skin penetrance. So our creams and ointments are um, certainly well suited for uh, clearing athlete's foot. And we talk about shoe health also being important with that shoe and sock health uh, hygiene piece, okay? Um, going barefoot in public spaces excessively. Now, um, Talking about public pools, um, you know, we're not going to wear aqua socks all the time, and that has its shortcomings too, because those uh, those garments aren't really uh, suited for uh, year in year out use. Those should be cycled through um, every year or two. Uh, so, uh, in a in a public pool situation, there is um, health uh, issues there where uh, um, pools are certainly. Um, clean and chlorinated. Um, so there's no reason to be overly neurotic, but just again, a bit of awareness is helpful. Um, controlling perspiration, if you sweat a lot, is helpful. Um, and all of those things that we talk about preventing toenail fungus are applicable here with preventing athlete's foot. Okay. Another skin problem, we're still talking about skin problems. So plantar warts, these are virus infections that result in a cauliflower like growth. Uh, usually on the bottom of the feet, but we can see them on the top as well. They can grow, become uncomfortable, especially if it's on the bottom of the foot. We see this more commonly in kids than adults, but we can see this at any age. And again, going back to if you're immunocompromised, you have some other underlying health conditions. If your immune system is a bit um, uh, less optimal than uh, someone that doesn't have that, you can be more susceptible. Okay, and this is what these look like, benign type presentation on the left to a very profound presentation uh, to that bottom right, these large cauliflower-like masses. Uh, certainly appreciate how that would be uncomfortable. Okay, treatment, uh, topical medications, uh, acid plasters, over-the-counter things can work. However, um, you have to use these uh, cautiously if you have diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, disease, et cetera, because those acids can actually uh, create chemical burns and not the most um, uh, appropriate if you have those underlying conditions. Non-invasive procedures, we use laser here as reference. This certainly takes care of warts, ultrasound, some newer techniques, or traditional surgery where we do excision. Okay, again, prevention, common sense type uh, uh, things, uh, foot hygiene, okay, drying your feet thoroughly, uh, controlling perspiration. We talk about shoe and sock health as well, um, pedicure awareness and all of that. Now I will say uh, uh, plantar warts are fairly contagious. So if someone has these in your household, uh, be aware that they can in fact spread. So just kind of be cognizant about common shower areas, wiping things down. All right, uh, we're going to leave the skin per se and move on to our uh, appendage of the skin that we see tons of uh, problems with very commonly ingrown toenail. So the, uh, the fingernail and toenail is an appendage of the skin. Uh, this condition is uh, a problem in which the nail uh, curves and grows down and can actually pinch the skin and cause an infection. All right, it can be caused by trauma or trimming your nail incorrectly, a little nod to proper trimming of your toenails more straight across and not too terribly short, because if you round them and trim them too short, as they grow in, they can pinch that skin. A little bit of nail anatomy here. So we see this most commonly in the big toe. Uh, you have the distal nail plate and the 
proximal nail fold, that skin there, and then we have our medial and lateral nail folds. And these are the areas in which um, are commonly affected. That nail can curve around. We say that's a pincer nail, if you will, or if it curves around a lot, we call that a trumpet nail, and that's where it wants to pinch. Okay, this is what we see. So the picture in the center bottom of the screen shows a uh, what we call a granuloma, which is an infection of uh, you know, that soft tissue on the side of the, uh, of the, of the toe. Um, you'll see inflammation, redness, it's quite painful. You can get drainage. Um, up there to the right shows uh, that incurvation that can happen with nail deformity over time. All right, so how do we take care of these? Well, we remove that offending nail border um, either temporarily, if it's kind of a first time offense, or if this becomes chronic, we can do a procedure where we actually kill the root of the nail on the side. Now, uh, I am quite particular if we do that procedure, maintaining a patient's uh, normal anatomy as best as possible. Uh, so uh, it's really difficult to tell we did this once that little surgical area heals. You might be able to tell that the toenail is more straight, but that incurvation piece that's already taken care of and it tends to not grow in. There's a small chance of recurrence, but if we do that procedure, uh, you're usually in the clear there. Antibiotics uh, topically and orally uh, can help support um, uh, the healing process. And certainly we discussed trimming your toenails properly, avoid, avoid rounding them too much or trimming them too short. Now, uh, genetic predisposition, we see like in uh, lots of uh, things that affect the body. Some of us are just prone to this, but avoid uh, tight fitting shoes or a pointed uh, narrow toe box can certainly be helpful if you avoid those things that prevent any bone toenails. Okay, so moving on, we're leaving the skin and our skin appendage, uh, that toenail now, and talking about foot and toe deformities. So common, common deformities we see are bunions and hammer toes. So what are these? Well, bunions, actually that term, that, that term um, it comes from the word turnip, if you will. So um, this is deformity of the great toe, which the toe turns in, and that first metatarsal head is more prominent. So the uh, toe goes towards the midline of the body, creating this uh, position where that metatarsal goes out, if you will. And this is a result of genetics and heredity, as well as an imbalance between the tendons that move the great toe up and down. We see this more common in women in flatter foot types. So if we look at a lady's anatomy, it, things are a little bit more rounded, if you will, with foot structure, and men have a more square type foot structure. There's a problem we're going to talk about later, arthritis, but women are more prone to what we call subluxation or this imbalance with the hypermobility of this imbalance, and men are more prone to compression disorder, so a degeneration, if you will, an arthritic change. And this is what this looks like. So as referenced, the big toe turns in, resulting in that med the tarsal head of the joint turning out, if you will, or closer to the midline of the body. And this is what uh, this can look like. Now, progressive bunion deformities can actually result in overlapping second toes or underlapping second toes. So this is uh, certainly something you do, uh, do, do want to address before we see this significant uh, problem. Here's radiographs showing this. Now, on the right shows an actual dislocation of that second toe where the uh, joint is what we call subluxed. So it's, it's in alignment, but uh, riding up there, if you will. All right, so how do we treat this? Well, if it's mild symptoms accommodating what you have, these are not surgical emergencies, but keep in mind, these do not go away unless we fix the problem. So inevitably it's not, um, a, a when uh, we're going to do this. Uh, it's an if, if you will, uh, early on, but then keeping that in mind that it uh, is a matter of time in order to get rid of it. So it's either you live with this or deal with it surgically. So palliative measures, shoe gear and activity modification for inflammation, uh, creams, anti-inflammatories, et cetera, and as referenced uh, surgery. This shows just some, some basic uh, maneuvers with bunion surgery. There's about 100 different ways to fix a bunion. You remove that medial portion of the first metatarsal head. You have to shift the bone over either closer to the middle of the foot or sometimes towards the front of the foot, depending on level of pathology and type of uh, uh, what we call recovery time. Certain more involved surgery, uh, common sense here, but 
that obviously takes more time to get better than uh, a more uh, uninvolved type procedure. Okay, so here's some before and after radiographs of a particular type of what we call distal bunion correction or osteotomy. Okay, uh, prevention, uh, wearing the right shoes certainly is a good start. Um, avoid shoes with uh, narrow toe boxes and excessively high heels. Uh, art supports and custom foot orthotics can help uh, slow the progression, but doesn't put the bunion back. Uh, genetics, of course, plays a role in all of this. Um, a part of uh, what I do for our group, I, I write a blog called A Step Ahead. There's um, related information here. I, I discuss uh, shoe gear and how to uh, measure your feet for shoes and how to choose appropriate shoes. A couple hints here, um, going towards the end of the day uh, to buy shoes because your foot independency tends to be uh, slightly increased in size. And we say the rule of thumb when you're measuring your longest toe is literally the rule of thumb. So you want a thumb's nail width from the uh, longest toe to the end of the toe box, which could be the first toe. It could be the second toe. If it's the third toe, you're just a little different, but we love you anyway. All right, moving on to hammer toes. This is a contracture, a bending of the smaller toes. So a bunion deformity is a deformity of the great toe. Uh, hammer toes are the littler toes, the second, third, and or uh, fourth and fifth toes, either in conjunction with each other or in and of themselves, uh, one or two toes like this. And like uh, bunion deformities, this is an imbalance between the tendons and ligaments surrounding the little toes. So the, the tendons that move the toes up are overpowered by the ones that move them down. Okay, so toes can rub in shoes resulting in corns, which are thickened pads on the top of toes or calluses, which is on the bottom of the feet. Uh, these can develop a sore, an opening, where that, um, that thickened tissue can actually create a sore underneath. Now, of utmost importance is patients with sensation loss for different reasons, uh, especially in diabetes, which is common. We say peripheral neuropathy, where you lose that protective sensation. So you might be rubbing in your sugar and not realizing it develop a significant infection. And again, as referenced, uh, just like bunions, women, because of their foot structure, tend to be more prone to this than men. This shows a hammer toe deformity in which you have this imbalance of the uh, ligaments that pull the toe up versus the ligaments that pull the toe down. This is what this looks like in uh, real time here. You can get overlapping or underlapping uh, significant problems. So treating this, a shoe gear and activity modification, preventing things from rubbing. These are not a surgical emergency, but they don't get better unless they're actually fixed surgically. Uh, some folks can live with this problem for several years. Other folks, it's uh, really hampering to their lifestyle. So like our bunion uh, treatments, uh, non-surgically, we can talk about palliation if we have inflammation here, pain creams even, sugar modification as referenced, and for corns and calluses, keeping that thickened skin uh, reduced can certainly be helpful. These uh, pads can also be used as well if someone's not a surgical candidate or they just want to take some time and uh, treat things uh, medically, uh, they can do things like this. All right, uh, example of surgery, uh, pretty common is what we call skeletal traction in toe surgery, where we use a, a percutaneous, meaning uh, through the skin, uh, through the toe, um, to keep things uh, held in place temporarily, and those pins come out later. All right, there's even implants and hardware. So this is showing uh, some combination uh, bunion and hammer toe surgery, where uh, the toes were corrected, both at that great toe joint and the lesser joints there, okay? So again, like uh, bunion prevention, wearing the right shoes, of good quality, avoiding excessive uh, tight shoes, narrow to, uh, toe boxes. Uh, genetics do, does play a role, so complete prevention uh, may not be possible. And referencing arch supports to control uh, biomechanics, uh, which uh, can redistribute those um, ligaments and tendons, how they function can help slow the progression of this deformity. Okay, now it's time for arthritis. So that's a, a wear and tear type of condition or an inflammatory condition, if you will, where joints wear out for different reasons. We all walk the planet. As referenced earlier, we're gonna walk this earth four times, maybe more in our lifetime. So things do wear out. So we have the two broad categories of wear and tear, as we say, non-inflammatory versus inflammatory. So inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, gout, and those variants, there's several several subsets of arthritis. 
uh, joint pain, stiffness, swelling, deformity. Uh, the foot joints that are most commonly affected is that great toe joint. I referenced uh, men being uh, more prone to great toe arthritis. The ankle, certainly in the middle of the foot, these are all joints that can be affected by arthritis. Okay, so it can look like this, where you can get these uh, nubby deformities of the great toe joint and uh, even the middle of the foot. And this is what this looks like on x-ray. That ankle picture on the right shows this degeneration where you have that talus bone, which is an interesting bone. If you make a fist, that's kind of like the shape of your talus bone. It doesn't have any uh, muscle attachments, just ligaments connecting the two leg bones. You can appreciate that there's some uh, compression of that leg down onto that ankle. Uh, the picture on the left shows a very profound, uh, very arthritic great toe joint where essentially there's no motion at all. And the middle picture shows uh, what we call a dorsal exostosis or bone spur, which prevents that great toe from moving up and down. Okay, so again, when we uh, talk about modification and pre preventive measures, or I should say palliative measures, shoe gear, modification, certain shoes um, might not be the most appropriate for someone with advanced arthritis. Orthotics, again, art supports controlling those biomechanics. And if you're talking about an inflammatory arthritis, controlling those underlying inflammatory processes certainly helps. So uh, gout, we see that more commonly in men. That's an inflammatory arthritis. Um, Anti-inflammatories, pain cream, steroid injections, and of course, surgery. So for great toe joint arthritis, we're still not quite there with having a great implant. There's some that have shown some benefit, but most often you either clean up the joint or you fuse it. Now, fusing the great toe joint can be somewhat daunting and concerning because, well, how are you going to move that great toe and walk? Well, the truth is that you have a joint beyond that great toe joint, what we call an interphalangeal joint, and that compensates, and that's where you're able to uh, get your, your motion. And this is a tried and true orthopedic uh, surgery that we do. Here's some examples of orthotics. These are uh, custom-made orthotics that we certainly do uh, a lot of at OrthoNeuro. The device in the center of the screen shows something called a Morton's extension, and that's a finger-like projection that helps prevent that big toe from moving. So that lever takes pressure off of that great toe joint. Here's some uh, arthritis surgery. I referenced uh, implant, what we call arthroplasty. We've made logarithmic advances in hip uh, replacement, uh, knee replacement, great toe arthritis replacement. We have a lot of options, but long-term there's some concerns. Now it's not to say we can't do this. And a lot of times we can get 20, 30, 40 years out of such implants, but just the science isn't quite there yet, hence my reference to uh, fusing that joint instead, and that's what this example is on the right. So you can see that there's a joint just beyond where those screws are. That becomes the great toe joint, if you will. So we put the big toe in a certain position that's uh, able to accommodate uh, common uh, motion throughout the day, and then that uh, joint just beyond where the screws are in that picture to the right, that be becomes more flexible. And even if you're a younger person in your 40s or 50s, this is a procedure that works exceedingly well. Okay, So wearing the right shoes certainly is helpful. Um, controlling the biomechanical abnormalities. And if you have an inflammatory arthritis, controlling those inflammatory processes can uh, be of uh, significant benefit to preventing uh, progressive joint uh, damage. Some medical foods, if you will, homeopathic things have shown some benefit, but the literature is a bit um, unfounded with some of those things. All right, moving on, tendinitis. So this is an inflammation of tendons or ligaments, if you will, uh, a weakness or instability. Okay, so repetitive overuse, depending on what your job is or your sports are, uh, results in those levers that move foot structures, foot structures and lower leg structures. Uh, these can get inflamed and uh, certainly can be uh, damaged uh, significantly in which you can actually get a rupture. Beyond uh, this talk is trauma, we're not going to get into that, but overuse um, related to a more acute time frame is what we see often as the uh, precipitating factor to ten tendinitis. So in the foot and ankle, our most common uh, tendinitis problems are Achilles tendinitis and posterior tibial tendinitis. There's a subset, uh, those of you that have tuned in probably are saying, hey, what about that other one? And we'll talk about that other one in a minute. 
So some anatomy here, the posterior lower leg there shows your Achilles tendon that hooks on your heel bone. That posterior tibial tendon in the middle of of the screen, that's job in life is to create the arch. And over time, as we fight gravity, again, walking this earth many times as we will, uh, gravity creates everything to fall, if you will. Uh, so the flat foot uh, will uh, be the natural tendency. It doesn't mean all of us will get flat feet as we age, but that's the more um, common problem that we see. The high arch foot kind of defies gravity. And beyond this talk, there's uh, several uh, reasons why people can have high arch feet, but our two common tendon problems are that uh, Achilles tendon on the back, that's actually the strongest tendon in the body, that's our motor that propels us uh, with our feet, as well as that posterior tibial tendon, that's our uh, another common tendon that gets affected. So uh, prevention and treatment here, anti-inflammatories and or steroids, possibly injections, we have to be very, very cautious when injecting the Achilles tendon or the posterior tibial tendon. In fact, that's almost last resort because uh, the Achilles tendon, if it weakens and snaps, that's obviously a big problem. Steroid injections repeatedly can weaken tendon structures. Uh, shoe gear and activity modification, mobilization depending. So we use a lot of what we call protective mobilization. So these are walking boots that um, we can keep going throughout our day, but this prevents that foot from moving. So we can be active, but still protected. Uh, controlling abnormal biomechanics and possibly orthotics as reference like some of the other problems. And if we have an imbalance that's beyond repair, if we have a tendon that's severely diseased, there is surgery, there is tendon grafting, there's surgical repair, et cetera. Now, talking about that other problem, the elephant in the room with this problem set is plantar fasciitis, okay? So this is inflammation of something that's kind of like a ligament, something sort of like a tendon, but not really. A fascia is like a flat band that kind of connects different uh, pieces and parts in the body. So in the foot, the plantar fascia separates your soft tissues most on the bottom of the foot from those structures deeper in the foot. So our, our other muscles, our other ligaments, our nerves, et cetera. So we see this as a very, very common cause of heel pain. So pain with activities after rest, we say this is post-static pain or post-static dyskinesia. So pain in that bottom of the heel, uh, you go to sleep at night, you get up in the morning, and upon arising, you hurt again. That's because everything has sort of settled and that inflammation settles in that area. Then you get up, moving throughout uh, the morning, and things ease up, all right? We see this more in the flatter foot type uh, as a predisposition to plantar fasciitis. Think about maybe a bow and a bow string. So you have your bow as your arch, if we flip it kind of over, and the bow string as the plantar fascia. When you pull or flatten out that bow, that pulls on the heel. And over time, that can cause inflammation. You even see some heel spurring, the dreaded heel spur. But we say that's a result of the problem and not the cause. So pulling on that heel, causes this reactive inflammation. We say inflammation re, uh, gives rise to calcification, gives rise to ossification, ergo the heel spur. So that, that pulling causes those changes that we see on x-ray. So it's a radiographic clue that that's probably what's going on. It's kind of a chicken or egg story. What came first, the inflammation, not the spur. There's no surgical reason to remove a heel spur on the bottom of the foot because that's again a result of the problem. There is surgical options to help with biomechanics to release part of that ligament if need be, but most of the time people get better with conservative things. Uh, other causes, shoe gear with lack of arch support, having uh, overuse and flattening of the foot, certain activities, job, et cetera. Uh, weight, being overweight certainly contributes to this. So we see our Achilles tendon on the back there with this picture. And on the bottom, we see this uh, plantar fascia this ligament on the bottom. And there is where this likes to pull, right there on the bottom. Now, more so on the inside, uh, if you will. So pulling on the inside of the heel, uh, as we roll, as we walk, we start on the outside of the heel and then finish off on the inside of the foot and toe off of our big toe, if you will. Uh, another analogy here, think of this plantar fascia as sort of like a celery stalk and those little fibers uh, the fibers and the celery, and those can actually pull and sometimes tear. And that's where we get uh, this inflammation that we see. 
So focusing on preventing, preventing the inflammation cycle and preventing it from coming back is a mainstay of treatment. So why do we have this? Well, um, in foot and ankle pathology, there is a lot to be said for an inflexible foot. The Achilles tendon, as stated, is the strongest tendon in the body. It can also be tight and your calf can be tight. So having a more flexible foot, being able to get your foot to what we call dorsiflexor move up. We like to see it beyond just that 90 degrees straight. We like to see a few more degrees more. And if we don't have that, we have a condition called equinus. And equinus, we think of, uh, you know, equus, the Latin for horse, how a horse's leg is. So having this flexibility certainly helps prevent a lot of foot problems, including plantar fasciitis. Uh, Anti-inflammatory steroid injections, we don't hesitate in injecting the plantar fascia. This is a very safe area to inject. Night splintage, wearing a device contraption at night, either while we sleep or while we have some downtime, helps with that flexibility, preventing that equinus as just referenced. Active stretching uh, modalities and ultimately surgery to release part of that or correct that, that contracture of the calf muscle. All right, other modalities, physical therapy, where we use steroid gel uh, under ultrasound, we call this iontophoresis or phonophoresis. There's a condition called extracorporeal, or a, um, a procedure called extracorporeal shockwave therapy, ESWT, terrible name, it sounds awful, um, but uh, it really is um, a very novel uh, technique that's been around a long time. Those of us that know someone or have experienced kidney stones, this is the same technique that they use to break up kidney stones. In musculoskeletal uh, medicine, this technique is used to break up inflammation, most commonly in the plantar fascia. We also see this uh, for uh, Achilles tendonitis, uh, epicondylitis, which is an elbow tendonitis, or even uh, a knee arthritis, or I should say knee tendonitis. So this outside of the body shockwave uh, therapy that's done under local can help break the cycle of inflammation. Now, as reference surgery, last resort, most people get better by just conservative means as referenced. Um, adjunctive procedures other than this plantar fasciotomy, uh, we reference uh, getting more uh, motion with that Achilles, with that calf muscle, with that gastrocnemius to correct those biomechanics. Okay, this is a uh, picture of what this extracorporeal shockwave device looks like. This is an office procedure that we do at OrthoNeuro from time to time. Uh, the machine comes with the technician that runs this, and I position the foot, anesthetize locally. Um, there's no downtime, you're a little sore afterwards, but a, a very excellent uh, technique. Here's a surgical option here. This is a endoscopic surgery. We'll release part of that ligament here. For endoscopic uh, surgery, you use a camera and instrumentation through a small incisions to operate on a body part through these uh, small windows into the body. Um, arthroscopic surgery, if you will, is through a joint endoscopics through a body cavity or space. And this is an endoscopic plantar fasciotomy. Uh, prevention, like a lot of uh, what we've talked about in uh, lower extremity orthopedics, a common theme here is supportive shoes, appropriate fitting shoes, orthotics as necessary, activity modification as appropriate, stretching, and uh, certainly maintaining a healthy lifestyle and correct weights. All right, I think we'll round out. This is our number six in our top six list. This is nerve problems. Lots of things here we can spend hours on this, but entrapment syndromes, we've all probably heard of carpal tunnel, which is entrapment syndrome of a nerve in the wrist, in the foot and ankle. We have tarsal tunnel, which is like carpal tunnel in the foot and ankle. Uh, we have Morton's neuroma, which is a, a pinched nerve between the metatarsal heads and the feet. Uh, also a common condition is peripheral neuropathy, most commonly seen as a result of uh, diabetic patients, long withstanding uncontrolled diabetes, but can be caused by other metabolic problems or medicines. So these include chemotherapy side effects. We say chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy, metabolic conditions such as vitamin B12 deficiencies, thyroid problems, et cetera. A little bit of nerve anatomy here, that posterior tibial nerve, um, which is a bit of a misnomer because there's not an anterior tibial nerve, but this is our posterior tibial nerve, tibial nerve, if you will. This is what gets entrapped when we have tarsal tunnel or carpal tunnel of the ankle, if you will. Then going more distal, you see those little nerves that uh, are between the metatarsal heads that supply the toes. 
Um, think of uh, the uh, spinal cord as a circuit board, if you will. So larger nerves give rise to smaller nerves, et cetera. So all this um, uh, is really a, an amazing uh, feature uh, of our bodies. Uh, again, beyond uh, our talk tonight of all that uh, the nervous system does. But these entrapment syndromes or these conditions related to nerve problems, we see quite a bit. All right, so talking about our entrapment syndromes, tarsal tunnel and Morton's neuroma, anti-inflammatory steroid injections are utilized, topical pain creams even, shoe gear and activity modification, all right, avoiding tight fitting shoes, rounded toe box versus a square or versus a more pointed uh, toe box, controlling abnormal biomechanics and surgery sometimes. So uh, again, using the carpal tunnel uh, analogy in the wrist, sometimes that those structures need release that are pinching that nerve, same thing in the uh, ankle. Sometimes we have to release those structures. Or you can have a possibly a, what we call a space occupying lesion in which um, a, a large varicose vein or even a, tumorous, uh, a tumor a growth can be affecting that tibial nerve. Those can be all addressed uh, surgically. With Morton's neuroma, sometimes we have to excise that small portion of nerve, which results in a, just a little bit of uh, numbness between the toes, but um, of significance uh, controlling the pain and getting rid of that is a small trade-off. You have sensation on the outside of the toes there. Okay, so with neuropathy, if you're having this as a result of diabetes or other things, controlling that underlying cause is very, very important. So side effects of medications, et cetera, having appropriate blood sugar control if you're diabetic, et cetera. Uh, medications, uh, treating nerve pain, uh, gabapentin, tricyclic antidepressants, et cetera, all these can be helpful. But very important, we're not to the stage where we can regrow nerve tissue. We're getting closer. But when you have nerve damage where you result, which results in permanent, what we call anesthesia, um, it's hard to get that back. So sometimes, unfortunately, left untreated, uh, in particular peripheral neuropathy and diabetes, um, sometimes the effects can be permanent and uh, significant. Okay, so a little bit of a wrap up here on some uh, preventive measures as we get into uh, the warmer months soon around the corner. Common sense hygiene of our skin and uh, toenails. Uh, remembering shoe and sock health, also uh, very important. Wearing well-made, properly fitting shoes. Uh, keep your feet active and flexible. So keeping our feet locked up in shoes all day long could be, um, you know, that takes its toll. So doing some stretches, some exercises uh, certainly go a long way. Uh, inspecting your feet, you know, they do a lot for us. So it's important to look at them. Um, if you have some mobility issues, putting a mirror on the floor and hovering your foot over top of the mirror certainly can be helpful. And then promptly addressing foot problems before they get out of control uh, certainly goes a long way. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, we uh, have some, some time for uh, some questions and answers, and I'm going to have Hannah come over here and help me out to get us where we need to be. All righty. Uh, so it looks like we have a few questions, and if you have any as we go through them, please feel free to add them in the Q&A box. Um, so the first one, can you have both toenail, toenail fungus and athlete's foot at the same time? In, indeed you can, yes. Yeah. So um, we kind of referenced, you can have a synergistic uh, pathophysiology where you can have one feeding the other, if you will. So athlete's foot can result in toenail fungus and toenail fungus can result in athlete's foot. Now, skin infections tend to be much more catchy than nail infections. Um, Nail infections take some time to develop, but they're also more stubborn to get rid of. So uh, we referenced uh, plantar warts. Those are fairly catchy. Athlete's foot can be passed around a little bit more easily than toenail fungus. But yes, you can definitely have both. All righty. And what is the best or what is the best or what is the beetle treatment for warts? Okay. Sorry. Yeah, that's a very good question. That's cantharone, beetle juice extract. Mm -hmm. In medicine, sometimes when you have a lot of treatments for something, that means either they all work very well or they all work kind of so-so. We see that with warts. So with plantar warts, sometimes you can growl at them one day and they're gone. Otherwise, uh, or other times we do everything short of blowing them up with dynamite and they persist. So cantharone, uh, that beetle juice extract, that's an injection, all right? Um, in my practice, we tend to use other things that are not as what we call caustic or irritating. So we do a lot of laser work. Um, combination uh, topical creams that compounding pharmacies 
make for us. Uh, that works well. A little antidote that I didn't reference in the pediatric population, um, stomach medicine actually uh, uh, can, can, you, can be utilized uh, uh, for this tagament. Uh, sometimes we find that side effects have a positive result. So tagament in the pediatric public po population was discovered to be antiviral. So that's something that, that we can use on occasion as well. And how rounded is too rounded for toenail trimming? Do you recommend cutting a V in the middle of your nail to allow the nail to grow inward? Um, that's a bit of a wives tale. So how round is too round? Um, you, you really don't want it to be pinching as it grows out. So this is not gonna be the easiest to answer without a visual, but um, where you just round it slightly, if you will, so that the nail fold on the end is just a little bit visible. Um, you, if you keep them totally square, that causes problems as well. So just where you can see a little bit of that nail fold on the inside or outside of that, uh, of that toenail, that's kind of what we're after there. Right. Is there a treatment for a bunion on my little toe? Yes. So that's known as a tailor's bunion. That harkens back to uh, historical reference as tailors used to sit cross-legged. Then we get that irritation of that fifth metatarsal area. So uh, as we correct a bunion of the great toe, we shift things in the same way to correct that bunion on the fifth toe or tailor's bunion or bunion at similar type uh, treatment surgery. Can I wear heels after bunion surgery? It's a very good question. Uh, you can certainly wear heels before and after surgery. Uh, over time, wearing shoe gear that is not the most healthy can cause these problems to develop quicker and can result in uh, recurrence. So uh, for our lady patients, we usually recommend a smaller, chunkier heel. It doesn't mean you can't wear something higher. Uh, from time to time, but uh, we reference that equinus, that contracture of the Achilles over time, that can result in all this sort of foot pathology. So keeping uh, your foot in a high heel for days and, and weeks and months on end or for years can result in that contracture of the heel. But uh, to answer this succinctly, yes, you certainly can wear high heels afterwards. Um, you have to recover after your operation, but uh, in moderation, we suggest a lower heel that's a little bit more uh, robust on the bottom. So a little bit chunkier heel, if you will. Doesn't mean it can't be fashionable. Um, uh, anecdotally, uh, something uh, to share my, uh, my family. I come from an Italian family and my great grandparents were cobblers in Italy. So I think my, my fate was cast from the get-go. So there was shoe discussions growing up. Uh, my, my one uh, grandfather actually helped make best Truman's wedding shoes. Um, uh, during that era when it was very common to have uh, shoe manufacturing all, all over the place in the United States in the 30s were a different time. But um, yeah, so uh, what we put on our feet is certainly uh, very important. Can you fix a claw toe? Yeah, so uh, claw toes, uh, there's three flavors of hammer toes, if you will. Um, a claw toe is literally think of a bird's claw where you have contracture at the two little joints. A mallet toe, think of like a, a mallet, like a hammer, has a contracture only at the distal joint. Some of this is hard to describe. A uh, hammer toe is where it's straight on the end, but kind of hooved up in the middle. Similar type uh, treatment where we remove a small portion of bone, letting the toe uh, lie flat, doing some things with tendon work, possibly using those little implants uh, to help keep that toe in, in correct position, all of those things. But yeah, hammer toes, claw toes, and mallet toes are all kind of different names, different specific names for these toe deformities. If you fuse my great toe, will I still be able to run? That's a very good question. Short answer is yes. Okay. Now, if you um, have hopes of playing for the Celtics next year, we have to be cognizant of that. There is limitations, but as reference, this is a tried and true orthopedic procedure. We fuse that big toe in a certain position where you're able to kind of get the best of both worlds. All right. Sprinting, um, it's not going to be the same. All right. But jogging, et cetera, you know, if you're a middle aged person, all right, this is again a tried and true orthopedic thing to do. In fact, our, our very significant bunion deformity, sometimes we don't have a choice. We have to fuse that great toe joint and balance things where we say more proximal in the middle of the foot. There's another joint. 
called the first metatarso cuneiform joint, which is a mouthful here, but there's a bunion surgery called a lapidus procedure. And, and a lot of times this is a tried and true way to fix this, prevent um, this hypermobility back there. So um, just correcting things and having the best of both worlds, that's where we get into this uh, fusion treatment for great toe arthritis or, or significant advanced bunions. Is gout only limited to the great toe mm. and is gout curable? Hmm. So gout is a condition in which your body makes either too much uric acid or uh, doesn't get rid of it. So we used to make more of a big deal about being an overproducer or under excreter. So um, certain foods can be triggers. Um, men are more prone to gout and the overwhelming uh, majority in the lower limb is the great toe because of how our anatomy is. However, gout is certainly not uh, restricted to just the great toe. The middle of the foot can uh, uh, be affected by gout, the ankle, actually fingers. You can even get what we call gouty tophi, okay, which is a term for these uh, nodularities that can even poke through the skin. The crystallized uh, disease tissue can actually come through. Uh, so uh, short answer, uh, although the great toe is most commonly affected, these other joints in the feet, can become affected as well, men more so than women, and controlling the uric acid metabolism. So some of us um, have certain triggers, those of us that have gout. So uh, some foods to keep in mind that can be gout triggers, cured meats and preserved meats, red meats, uh, tomato sauce, citric acid. Now, sometimes you look at this food list, you think, wow, I can't eat anything. That's not true. So you just have to kind of figure out what is uh, more insulting uh, with uh, these certain foods. Now there's medication to prevent attacks and there's medication to treat attacks. So what I usually do with my patients, if they have one or two attacks a year, is it uh, necessary to take a preventive medicine uh, throughout their whole life? Well, we kind of discuss that together. I'll suggest not. And if you have just one or two attacks, we treat that with anti-inflammatory medications injections or medicine is designed to treat just that, just a gouty attack. If you're getting three, four, five uh, attacks, especially around holidays, when we're eating, drinking, and being merry, then it's no fun, certainly. Then we talk about preventive measures. Uh, can plantar fasci fasciitis uh, spontaneously resolve, uh, and how common is a surgery for the condition? Okay, so um, most of the time, as referenced, uh, it uh, can be treated quite successfully non-operatively. So stretching, controlling biomechanics, addressing the inflammation, okay, all of those things. Can it get better on its own? Well, uh, if we want to just take a little nod to maybe spontaneous resolution is just a little bit of stretching, a little bit of anti-inflammatory medication, a little bit of help. Yes, it can get, get better on its own. I will say in my practice, and this is supported by the literature, jump-starting things with a little stronger anti-inflammation modalities, such as a steroid by mouth or a steroid injection, really does um, move things along to getting better uh, faster. Does diabetic neuropathy uh, always cause, cause permanent nerve damage? Uh, is it preventable? Okay, so um, uh, prevention, okay, ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure, if you will. So getting at our, our nerve damage early on is very, very important. So uh, diabetic patients um, controlling that uh, blood sugar as tight as possible is quite important for preventing permanent nerve damage. So uh, to answer that question, a very, very important one, no, if you're diabetic, you could certainly have normal sensation throughout your life if you control your blood sugars as tight as possible and as best as possible. If you have what we call painful or painful diabetic peripheral neuropathy, we have medications to treat that pain, to treat that discomfort. And uh, symptoms are related to like stinging, burning type pain, weird sensations, what we call paresthesias. Um, where we get into trouble is when we get anesthesia, okay? We have lack of sensation, so protective sensation. We lose that, we don't know what's going on with our feet. That's certainly a significant condition, condition and um, uh, a reason for significant concern. So when we get to that stage, uh, maybe as we move on with medicine, being able to regrow nerves or prevent, uh, to reverse permanent uh, nerve damage where we have anesthesia uh, uh, problems where we have that permanent nerve damage, maybe we'll see that, but we're not there yet. So hang in there, control that blood sugar as best as possible, and you'll be just fine.
Alrighty, it looks like that was our last question of the evening. So we'll go ahead and stop sharing the screen. Thank you everyone for participating in our first webinar of 2023. Our next webinar will be uh, next month on March 7th at seven o'clock. Uh, our webinars this year are going to be on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Uh, and then the next webinar will feature Dr. Rodney Commissar who will be discussing throwing injuries in athletes. Thank you so much and have a great night.